Society. Please give a big warm welcome to Mr. Brian just now. Thank you. Brian, well, we're going to do, uh, after the movie, a thorough Q&A, where okay. uh, we can ask all the questions you'll have, because I know there is quite a few in the audience who've never seen the movie. Which one of you are going to see this movie for the first time? Raise your hands. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that is actually really cool. You're going to get a really, really, really cool mind-bending experience. Um, and we're going to talk more about the movie when it's over. So okay. please hang around, uh, and you can ask all the questions you may have. Do you have a few words you want to tie to the movie for those who haven't seen it yet before we start? Well, I think the ones that haven't seen it, you're going to the past. You're going back to the 80s. A very special time in the 80s. <laughs> cool. Well, enjoy it, and we'll be back after the movie. Have fun. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess the first obvious question is, how did you get the idea and what was the inspiration for this movie? Well, I would like to ask a question first. Sure. So all these people who've never seen this old movie, uh, was it kind of like what you expected? <laughs> I don't know, right? Yeah. You came to see an old movie you'd never seen, but somebody said, well, it's one of those 80s movies. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't hear any response. <laughs> um, the movie was actually, it originated because I had made a few movies. I wanted to direct a movie now. And I was afraid that if I directed, you know, they always say that a first time director is making two movies in one, his first and his last. <laughs> and I didn't want to be that guy. So I thought, well, what if I'm no good? And the, the calling card I had was that I owned the reanimator sequel rights. And so I had a friend who was making a company and he was, they were financing movies. I said, well, I'll give you, I, I'll make the Bride of Reanimator with you if I can direct it. Oh yes, okay, okay. But I first have to make another movie in case the first one's bad, I knew I would get another chance. And um, he said, sure. They were financed by, by Japanese money. And as I often say, the story of a movie begins with the financing. And the character of the movie is very related to the financing. Um, I, so we had a deal. Let's make a movie. And um, a, this guy, Rick Fry, came up to me with a script one day. I didn't know who he was. And he said, here, here, read this script. And I said, okay. And I really liked it. It was called Society, and it was very paranoid. It was about a kid who thinks his parents are very strange, and it turns out they are. Um, it ended up at the end that they had a blood cult, and they were killing the kids and draining their blood, and it was kind of that type of thing. But I really liked the paranoid aspect of it, because I had just spent a year working very intensely with um, Dan O'Bannon, who is a, was the director of Return to Living Dead, and also was the writer of um, Alien. Um, Alien, and a number of other things. Um, but he was, he was really kind of a crazy genius type guy, kind of dark. And I had spent a whole months working with him late at night, um, on a movie called The Men, about a woman who discovers that all men are aliens. And it was so paranoid. I really loved it. But when I finally got the financing, Dan is a little unbalanced, and he just dropped out. And I lost the movie. So I think I already had this whole world in my head of paranoia. So when I saw their society script, I said, oh, yeah, I'm already here. I get this. And it's just a teenager, and every every teenager feels like they've been adopted, and they're not, they don't fit, and all this kind of stuff. So that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. um, immediately, the Japanese wanted me to meet with Screaming Mad George, who was a Japanese, began as a punk rock musician or a punk art rock, in a band called The Mad, 
and he loved Screaming Jay Hawkins, and so he called himself Screaming Mad George. And he was really into surrealism, and they said, he does, make a, he does effects. See if you could let him do some effects for the movie. And when I met him, um, I immediately was like, we were immediate friends. And he showed me, I went to his house and he showed me, you know, we watched Andalusian Dog and looked at Dali paintings and all his stuff is very, um, very surrealistic. And I said, yeah, that's what we, you know, let's go there. And I was trying to think of something to do with the movie that wasn't just like a bloodbath at the end. And I, and I'm, I love effects. And I thought, what would I like to see that I haven't seen yet? And I, I thought, well, I'd like to see people's bodies melding into one another. Uh, you know, well, how can we put that in the movie? And so I tried to back engineer the movie. So that became the payoff instead of the, the blood cult. And um, I also tried to take the script, which is wholly... Uh, I mean, it's uh, Rick and Woody Keith already had the, you know, the script was there, the basic structure of it and everything, and um, the characters. And Woody Keith is from Beverly Hills. And this um, is kind of this fevered dream autobiography of Woody Keith. And his parents are very wealthy. He grew up in Beverly Hills, and he thought that they were really kind of had some weird black magic type of stuff going on. You know, he just is a very paranoid guy. And so he, the script really reflected that. And, but when I mentioned, and, and the, what I tried to bring out of the script, my part of it was to, was to change it from a blood cult, for example. And I also tried to bring out what I thought were the themes that were already there. They, I didn't add them, but I felt like the, you know, the idea that you're adopted, the idea that you're not from your parents, the idea that they're different, the idea that society is different, um, the idea that rich people as a class can be very different, and the idea that, that the incest was certainly a a prevalent part of it and a very uncomfortable part. And I had been reading about horror movies, about always dealing with taboos. And a lot, and it turns out, you know, I realize a lot of horror movies are really about incest. In one way or another, that's a real strong taboo that, you know, if it isn't a taboo everybody shares, it doesn't quite work. And so that was definitely, of course it was in there, because when they hear about the shunting, <laughs> you know, they say, first with your dad and me, and then, you know, and you go, oh my God, this is a girl and her parents. And so, you know, we added the scene where Bill, Billy goes into the bathroom. And also I knew that we had to see up front a little bit of weird stuff to keep the audience involved. Um, so anyway, that's kind of how the whole thing um, evolved and we tried to make the whole ending be kind of a sucker punch with the shunting with screaming mad george whatever i saw that he could possibly do we just put it in whether it made sense or not and then try to make sense later <laughs> you said before that that uh, when you started out with this movie you had already secured the deals to direct pride mm -hmm. of reanimator do you think if you hadn't had that movie to follow up this one, that you would have gone this far with this movie, or it seems like you didn't really have any concerns with this movie and just went for it. I think when you begin doing things, you're kind of kind of dumb about it. You're ignorant, I guess. And no, I think I thought this movie was going to be like the number one movie in America when it came out. <laughs> I mean, I just thought, wow, this is great. You know, everybody's going to like this movie. And so it was a big surprise to me when even my friends kind of didn't like it. <laughs> and actually, it's only been in the last few years anybody's liked it, except in Britain. In UK, it was quite a success. In Italy, it showed on TV a lot. 
<laughs> uh, France and Spain, it kind of worked. But in the U.S., I, I was like, people didn't really want to, you know, have to face me about it. And so, I don't know, I just kind of got used to that it was, you know, it kind of didn't work the way I thought it was, and that yeah. I probably should pull myself back a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and there are also, uh, maybe they're just rumors, but stories floating on the internet saying that you have actually worked on the idea for a sequel to society. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, you know, this, it's funny, it was kind of a, it was kind of a Barry movie for a while. And then just, you know, like six or seven years ago, I started getting some, you know, I would get emails where they'd say, we want to screen society. And I'd say, wow, that's, you know, that's great. Um, and then it kind of picked up and to things like this, that, oh, in Denmark, they want to show society. What? <laughs> How did they know about it? And, um, and it became kind of, and then of course it's, the, it's like, 20 years or 25 years later, and also I think part of it is because the um, the there's this renewed or this new kind of it's sort of a false it's kind of a nostalgia for the 80s mm. by a lot of people who were never there. <laughs> But I think it's because there's this right now time has gone by and the 80s now seem like this kind of golden age of genre movies for a number of reasons. And I think, if you, you look at it, yeah, I think they, they did have their own character. And I see a lot of people like now to look at 80s movies, the fix, laugh at the styles. I mean, the clothing styles and hairstyles really are ridiculous, <laughs> right? I thought the 70s were bad. Wow, when I look at these and see those shoulder pads on the girls and that's big hair and you kind of go wow did people really think that looked good you know <laughs> so there's that and it's all sort of a certain era you know certainly in the united states it was the reagan era it's kind of a very strange time and i think that there was a um you know there's an interest now there's a retro interest people like like to collect VHSs now and have vinyl. And I think there's a reaching back to trying to recapture something that isn't quite so electronic. And I think that's part of it. And so when you go back to those days, some movies tend to hold up. Some that you would think would really hold up don't. And so it's kind of a hit or miss. And luckily, society is sort of, I think because because especially the shunting never led to a bunch of movies like that. It's kind of a little bit unique, and I think that there's a, I think there's a value placed on something that is, is kind of unique. Mm -hmm. But have you, or are you working on a sequel? Yeah. <laughs> um, there's, um, there's a few different lines of it. I've talked to a lot of people, and it's not really... I don't really think you can continue the story because who cares? <laughs> who cared then? They didn't chase after those guys, did they? They said, well, okay, Take it, you know, go ahead. Uh, I don't know that, that Billy really is the story you want to see. I think maybe another movie in that world makes sense. And I think also with the, the you know, I think Billy was shocked by the truth about society. I think today maybe that character would be female and would probably, you know, confronted with the horror of it all, would probably just want to be a part of it. And I think that's celebrity culture and the kind of this, this worship of the ultra rich. So maybe the sequel will go more into the world of the famous or The desire well, to be I was, famous? Actually, I was, uh, the, most of the versions are uh, take place at these um, nightclubs, like on Hollywood Boulevard, that you can't get in. And if you get in, you got to get into VIP. Then you got to get into the VVIP. There's always a door you can't get into. Or you got to get to the after party. And if you're at the after party, there's a room you can't go into. And I think this whole, this is a good kind of um, format 
for uh, for another society story. Yeah, and when can we see it? <laughs> um, I guess we'll just have to make up a collection, and <laughs> we'll see it Here's next a hat. year. <laughs> uh, we definitely have time for uh, questions from you guys. Any questions about the movie? Yeah. Uh, when you make the movie, uh, there was uh, a lot of censorship. Uh, did you have to cut out something? We made some cuts in the in the shunting. Um, not as much as you'd think. I mean, most of the movie is pretty ordinary, you know. I mean, if you think about it, nothing really is outrageous. Um, with the shunting, at first, I had to. We had to give it to the to the MPAA to get an R rating. That was part of the deal with the company. Um, originally, the MPA said, "Well, you have to cut the last reel." <laughs> <laughs> But you know, you just keep working and find. You know, normally with that kind of cutting. It's um, you keep doing it and sending it back. After a way, they get after a while, they get tired of watching it, and basically, they just want you to take away the bits that work really well. <laughs> so, the, 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 some people say that if, if the MPAA wants some cuts, you basically just take it back and say, "Yeah, I've done it," and then send it back the exact There was way that it was. at one time you could do that. Yeah, but not anymore. No, because with digital you have to kind of give a complete version. But today I don't know what they cut. I mean, everything seems okay now, right? Yeah, just watching TV. <laughs> Other questions? Someone at the door. Uh, the woman. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you can show you can show a butt uh, a butt head, but you can't show a penis. Is that right? Maybe. Because there weren't any penises. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Um, we didn't go there. Um, butthead seemed funny. Yeah. Um, I know one of the new scripts I've seen had a penis nose. I don't know if that's funny or not. You know. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, about the shunting scene, how did you convince the senior citizen extras to participate in that scene? I never. I. I Never fail to be amazed by what people will do in front of you. <laughs> and, and a lot of the people there, this is, you know, a relative, you know, it was a low budget movie for the time. It wasn't, it, obviously it's a movie. It's not a, what you'd call a micro budget movie today. Um, we tried to make it be like a real movie. I, whenever I, I always try to make the movie look like what I consider a regular movie, you know. And, um, We did get extras, but they were the type you had to get extras that would bring their own that had a tuxedo or evening dress. And a lot of the people in that scene are from the crew, friends and neighbors. There's even journalists there. We had uh, <laughs> we had journalists, uh, horror you know mag you know horror magazine journalists that come to do a set visit. Take off your clothes and get in there. They love it. <laughs> and what amazes me is when you put people in front of a camera, they love to do that kind of stuff. They just, it's like a freedom. And it's and it, somebody who would seem so straight otherwise, if they have a chance, you know, they would love to like munch on the guts of a dead person or, you know, do something really weird. And I don't, I think it's liberating and it makes you, It makes you feel better afterwards. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right uh, just a comment. I, uh, I've, I've never seen this uh, movie before, and I really loved it. Um, I think it's uh, it reminds me that nothing nothing has changed uh, in in some ways. Um, I was seeing when I was watching it, I was like, oh, the rich guys, which just like now. What? Well, I, sometimes I think that's part of the reason it was, it kind of came back a little in the U.S. Because uh, when I made it, it, I think in U.K. it kind of worked. On one level it worked because they have no problem understanding class. And in the U.S. we have this mythology that there is no class. It's only if you work hard, you'll get rich. And if you don't you'll be homeless and it's up to you and there's an idea that it's all an even playing field uh, after 2008 i think it became a little bit more clear that oh you know what 
that's really a stupid fantasy. That's not the way the world works. And so I think to a certain degree that, that helped because society wasn't meant to be a kind of a criticism of, a, of, of, so, society, of social structures. It was meant to be an entertaining film that just happened to be based on, you know, class, but class becomes a science fiction concept, then on vampires, you know, or werewolves or some other, other kind of um, idea. And so, but it is there. You're dealing with rich people, the rich always feed off the poor. And I think that's not something, to, from my point of view, I always thought it should be advertised as a true story. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of expressionistic, but it's certainly not, and I think that the key point is when the kids escape, nobody bothers chasing them. Why would they? Were well, they're going to go yell and tell the big secret? We all know the secret. <laughs> you know, people with power exploit people who don't have power, and, you know, I think that's that's... You know, in a way, it just gives it an, it makes it a little more unique. I think the story becomes a little more unique because all those effects and everything are based on on something that isn't, a, it's not a typical horror movie trope. You know, normally horror movies would be a little more into the, into psychology and religion and, and, and mystic or, you know, legends and stuff. And this is a little more of a sci-fi um, basis for, uh, you know, I guess, I, I, had, I always had a hard time even calling it a horror movie, and I'm a horror fan. I don't, I like horror. I'm not trying to say, oh, this isn't a horror movie, it's something else. It's just that it, it seems more surrealistic to me than horror. You know, it doesn't, for me, horror has a, but maybe there's a feeling to that, you know. I, to me, it's kind of delightful, the end. I just find it really funny and really, I, you know, I like the delirium at it. I try to have a movie end in delirium. I, I kind of, I think that's sort of fun. You know. More questions? Yeah. Making a sequel to the time series use uh, classic special effects or will you stick to CGI? Um, I, I would, w I would of course um, begin with with rubber effects, mm -hmm. um, puppets. I like rubber and puppets, and I like puppetry because I think um, the puppeteer gives it life. The, the life is given by the performer. Uh, I, I know people can put their hand in a stocking and bring it to life. It, it's incredible what a, what a performer can do, a puppeteer can do. With CGI, I have worked with CGI and I think I'm fairly, I think I have my own very clear ideas as to why CGI is doesn't work for me a lot and one in a very simple way one reason is because it's worked on on many levels so a CGI creature or a CGI effect is done with a lot of different machines with a lot of different technicians or artists and each one adds something one makes the, the skeleton of it, one makes the animatronic, one puts the skin on it, one puts the, the, the wind, one, puts the, one lights the set, one um, puts the hair or the, or the reflections. So there's all these levels of it. And all of them are given a certain budget for how much time they can work on it if you're working, not, on, not working on Harry Potter or something. And I think even that, they have budgets for time. If it's not going the way you want it, you can't change it because you can't go back. It's This is the next level. You can't go, you know what, I, I don't think this movement is working right. Well, they would have to undo everything to go back there and you just, it, it becomes a real problem and it's very hard to have anybody who's really breathing, really performing it. All these very talented people are having a part of it, but there's no real coherence to it. They also tend to, um, they tend to do what CGI can do, which is make things go real fast. 
they just jump all it's like transformers it's like it jumps everywhere every cgi creature you ever saw they just they jump way up there and they jump over here and it, why because you can like yoda. if you had it huh yoda well, yoda was a puppet oh yeah but in the prequel, oh right the second, yeah. and i think that that's like cartoons it's like children's cartoons you want to see it happen fast but it looks animated and i think that that if you try to give weight to it, each one of a CGI shots, you know, the shots are like one and a half seconds, two seconds. That's how much you budget. Well, they say, what, you're going to have it do this? Or do you want to have it jump up to the ceiling in two seconds? I mean, come on, it costs the same. Let's, let's give them something. And they want to do that stuff. And I think that that is uh, that always makes the CGI look kind of false because it doesn't seem to have weight. It doesn't seem to work within the world of the movie where actors walk around. On an animation, the actors can jump all over the place too. So I think that always brings it down. But what CGI is great for is getting rid of wires, getting rid of pulls, getting rid of people trying to manipulate things, adding elements. And I tried to do that even in... Some of the movies I did in Spain, like on, on um, Beyond Reanimator, for example, we wanted the girl to start have the soul of the warden. And Screaming Mad George did this effect in Spain. And so we tried to have the real girl, but also do mechanical parts, build a face for her where there were um, um, like metal pieces pushing against the the skin so it, it was popping out but then by adding her real eyes in there and by adding a few more places that are digital faking them in well pretty soon you don't know what you're looking at and you have kind of a real cool effect but i think you have to do it by watching it if you're going to build the whole effect i would never build the shunting out of CGI, it would look ridiculous. But I would certainly do the shunting and not have to hide 13 people underneath it. Like in the wide shot, there's 13 people under there with little video cameras, bad ones back then, making these same things happen again and again. And I think that that would be great if you could like have people actually standing out there doing some of the manipula manipulation and dressed in green so you could get rid of it. So. I think you could add, you could add different effects within the rubber effects, and I think that that's where I would go with it. And would you bring back Screaming Mad George? If he would come, you know, it's really hard with him. He moved back to to Japan, and he does his own music and art there, and you know, you'd have to drag him back. Yeah, we will do it, all of us. <laughs> we still have time for some questions. Um, if they had, it probably would have been more successful. <laughs> I think a lot of people just didn't know how to take it. And I confess to being someone who was, who, uh, who had two non-cinema influences in my life in the 50s when I was a kid that really marked me. And one was EC Comics, the uh, comics of Tales from the Crypt and the Vault Keeper and that, which was these incredible horror comics where people were always doing terrible things to each other and cutting off their heads and being zombies. And, and it was all kind of funny, too. It was all gory and pulpy and, and ironic. And then the other element was Mad Magazine, which was a satirical com humor magazine. And when I, when I was a kid, I, I was shocked by it. I couldn't believe it. I, I took it seriously. I didn't understand irony. I didn't understand satire. Once I got it, I became addicted to it. And now, all my life, I've used irony, even in everyday conversations, if I don't stop myself. It's sort of a way 
to comment on stupidity in life without constantly commenting on the stupidity in life. You, it's, you say things that have a subtext, that are ironic. Satire, I think, is when you have more of a, a, systematic, um, a systematic subtext for what's going on. Irony, you can just do it from situation to situation. And I think that when on movies like Reanimator, Society Bride of Reanimator, um, a lot of these movies, they're full of, it's full of irony. It's not really, it's not meant to really be comedy. Of course, some of it certainly is pretty comedic. You know, it's kind of, but a lot of it is just like kind of making fun of what's there, making fun, you know, and we were doing a teenage movie. How can you take that seriously? I mean, this was a style of movie, you know, in that time of kids in high school. It's all sort of ridiculous. So all the irony you put in helps you have fun with it. It gives you a sense of fun doing it. And I think if you take, of course, if you watch the movie like it's a real serious thing, maybe it wouldn't be as entertaining. Maybe you'd just go, this is stupid. Or, well, what is it? What's going on here? But if you see it as a, as a piece of fun, you know, that, wow, this is just crazy. You know, this is, there's a lot, I think there's a lot of irony, and the more you see it, probably the more you, you, you enjoy the movie. You don't have to take it so seriously. We have time for one last question. No, no, I don't. I don't think so. I, I think there's. I don't know what's happened today, but there's a. There's a. For me, it seems like everything is like. I don't know if it's deadly serious, but within a genre, the genre is played very straight. It seems like there's an idea that if you just show, really grisly, graphic pain, that that's somehow entertaining. I don't know. Um, I don't see, I like horror movie. I, I love horror because it's transgressive, because it crosses the line. It does surprises you by going over the line on something. And, you know, when it doesn't do that, I'm less entertained. I don't get so much out of it. And I, and I, I think the horror movies today, people they're, they're, you know, people can really shoot movies well now because they have the, you know, the, the cameras and the editing and all that is, is accessible to everybody. And they seem to have watched, everybody's watched a lot of behind the scenes and, and you know, director's commentaries. And they, you can really learn how to shoot a movie now. And so it's, they're not quite as, as clumsy maybe as in the 80s. But... I don't, I don't, most, you know, a lot of them just bore me. I, I just can't, I don't quite know how to fill in the spaces. I guess I feel like if you're doing something pretty typical, well, at least make a little irony out of it. <laughs> Give it a little subtext and keep it entertaining. And, uh, but I wonder also whether we're kind of living in a time that's not, um, that doesn't have a lot of humor, you know. Maybe that's maybe that's lacking because we do tend to make the movies tend to re, 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 you know reflect the culture, and I'm not sure that um, I don't know I, I I certainly don't see a lot of a lot of really ironic or or humorous you know horror movies I mean something like Cabin in the Woods which obviously is a it's a deconstruction of horror movies but that one's worked for me. I was delighted by it. I was laughing the whole time. There was great.